Finding the Voices. Uh, today we have invited Sanhita Ambas, who is the International Legal Advisor at the International Commission of Jurists. Um, and I had actually read an article um, Sanhita has written, which is featured in Huff Huffington Post, The Undemocratic Silence on AFSPA. And I wanted to uh, know a little bit more on the report, and uh, we have invited Sanhita to share about that. Uh, so for, first of all, Sanhita, thank you so much for uh, featuring that article. Um, I was uh, very happy to see you know, specifically someone out of our community uh, writing about us. So much for um, yeah for, for arranging this. I'm really excited. Yeah. All right. So if you can introduce a little bit about yourself, I just wanted to get a sense of how you got this article and how are you connected to Manipur. Uh, of course. So I'm a lawyer. I uh, was uh, I did my undergraduate degree in India, and then I did my master's in human rights after that. And I've been working in the general field of human rights since. Currently, I work as the international legal advisor at the International Commission of Jurists, and I focus on South Asia. And one of the things that our organization does is work on issues of accountability and impunity. And that's where our interest in the AFSPA and the imposition of the AFSPA in Manipur comes from. And that's the background with which we wrote this article to basically talk about the impact that that law has had on the state and how that's a really terrible thing. So was this your first article? So we had written previously as well. I had an article before this uh, about a high court judgment that came out in November last year, from the Meghalaya High Court, which recommended that the AFSPA be imposed in parts of Meghalaya where it wasn't imposed already, so in the Garo Hills area. And that article oh. argued how it was a big mistake for the court to have given that sort of decision for two reasons. One, that the AFSPA is such a problematic law, and the role of a court is to protect people's human rights, not reinforce the violation of these rights by promoting the AFSPA. And the second, that under the AFPA itself, the decision to impose the law lies with the executive and not with the judiciary. So that article analyzed the problems with that particular decision. So you are mainly uh, specialized and focused on AFSPA right now? Well, looking at all forms of impunity and laws that facilitate impunity, and AFSPA is definitely one of the biggest examples of those laws in India. We can also look at other legislation and other provisions that have a similar impact. Okay, so for those, um, you know, for our listeners who are not very much familiar about AFSPA, can you briefly explain about the about AFSPA? Absolutely. So the Armed Forces Special Powers Act, it's a security legislation in place in India, and it can potentially apply to any of the northeastern states, and one version of the law can also apply to the state of Jammu and Kashmir. Uh, there have been many problems with the law, and a lot of people, both internationally and domestically, have pointed out to why it's such a problematic legislation. One of the things that it does is that it gives armed forces, um, particularly armed forces, for example, in Manipur, extensive powers, including the power to shoot and kill in, um, in certain situations. It also requires that if anybody is to be prosecuted for things that they've committed under the AFPA, they need government permission, because of which very few people are prosecuted, very few government servants or security forces are ever prosecuted for human rights violations. And because of the range of powers given to security forces, as well as this impunity that they have, laws like the AFSPA also facilitate other human rights violations. So rape, torture, enforced disappearances, extrajudicial execution, all of these happen with, with impunity in Manipur because the acts of the security forces are protected by the AFSPA. 
and um, one, I mean, these problems with the AFPA had been pointed out multiple times, both by local civil society groups, by um, international actors, and we've not seen any moves in the government yet to do something about it, to repeal it. Right, so in your article you mentioned about the Given Ready Committee um, formed um, in Manipur. So can you share a little bit about that committee and the recommendations which came out of it? So the Given Ready Committee was set up in 2004, and it was set up in the aftermath of the unrest and the uh, protests that happened after Andhra Manurama's alleged rape and murder by the Assam Rifles in Manipur. It was a government set up committee and it came out with its report in 2005. And I just want to read one paragraph from, from the recommendation because it's so powerful and it's been quoted by many other people since. So um, the report commented on the, um, on the AFSPA and said it basically recommended that the AFSPA be repealed. It said that um, the AFSPA had become a symbol of oppression, an object of hate, and an instrument of discrimination and high-handedness. And it recommended that on those grounds, the AFSPA should be repealed. And this report was submitted in 2005. The government kept it a secret for many years, but it finally, it was leaked. And it's been 10 years since such report uh, and its recommendations were submitted to the government. Since then, there have been many other government-related bodies that have either explicitly supported what the G1Z committee said, or have endorsed its recommendations in different ways. So, for example, the Second Administrative Reforms Committee, in their fifth report, also supported what the G1Z committee said and felt that the AFSPA should be repealed. More recently, in 2012, the Supreme Court set up a fact-finding committee, the Santo Shekde Committee, to look into some of the extrajudicial executions that happened in Manipur. And that committee also, again, is reinforced for the Human Rights Committee. It said that the AFSPA, it actually reintroduced the quote I just read out, and it said that the AFSPA should be repealed. And the Justice Barma Committee has commented on the AFSPA in the context of sexual violence in 2013, saying that um, it should be repealed or at least significantly revised. And alongside all of these, Indian authorities have said so. There have been a great many international organizations and authorities that have also recommended something similar. So almost every year special rapporteur or special procedure that has commented on India or visited India has made um, has made a similar recommendation that the AFSA should either be repealed or should be significantly revised. And these reports start from 1997, and they go all the way down to 2015, and they're saying exactly the same thing again and again. In early 2015, there was some news that he said the government was going to reject the findings of the Human Rights Committee report. But later on in the years, when they were asked this question in Parliament, they gave the answer that we quoted in the article that I just written about in Huffington Post, that they were still considering the recommendations, and they didn't say what will be done in the future. But it's 10 years since such a was submitted, so it's a very long time. Right, and also um, to delve more into uh, Manorama's case, um, if you can share a little bit in detail about the findings in her case, which was clearly put out uh, in the report on you know, how, uh, how he died, how he was found. Uh, um, so the Jeevan Reddy Committee report was a more general report about the functioning of the AFSPA, and their recommendations were more systemic. But there has since been a judicial inquiry into the Manorama into the Manorama case specifically. And there's been a report that was made public recently which clearly establishes that the Assam Rifles were responsible for her alleged rape and murder. But it doesn't, the, her case is still currently pending in the court. And I think her family was provided with some compensation by the Supreme Court recently. But the prosecutions in her case, they're still pending. And one of the reasons why it's so difficult to prosecute security forces is because of the AFSPA. One of the sections in the AFSPA says that if um, anybody from the security forces is to be prosecuted for anything wrong that they've done. So, for example, in Manorama case, it would be for the, for the 
fight any of the allegations that she was called a murder, the government has to give permission for the prosecution. And as of today, we are not aware of a single case where the prosecution, the permission for prosecution has been given. So it's one of the biggest barriers to accountability, not like the yeah. Right, but uh, you know the very fact that there was compensation for Manorama's family. What does that mean? Because I'm always hearing in cases uh, like this that you know the government has given some compensation money. I think in Manorama's case it was ten lakhs, and in other cases I've heard the government offering five lakhs. So what does that mean? You know, um, we don't see the justice. Um, we do hear some of this monetary uh, given by the government. That's right. And like in Manorama's case and other cases of human rights violations as well, the government will often give compensation to either the victim or the survivor or the family. And it's important. Uh, under international law, for example, compensation is a very important part of the things that the victim has or the survivor has a right to. But Compensation can never replace or be a substitute for accountability for finding out who did, who committed the act and ensuring that they are prosecuted and punished as per law. So the fact that family has been given compensation shouldn't be a reason to stop prosecutions or to stop the progression of the case because that's equally important and it should be independent of the compensation. Right, yeah, because I'm getting the feeling that we haven't seen any justice, so just, you know, the act of giving the compensation seems to be like, oh, okay, we have looked into that case, we, are, we have given the compensation, and nothing seems to go beyond that. And like you have mentioned, this is a case of more than 10 years, and there are many other cases, too. Absolutely. There are so many other cases and a range of human rights violations. There are extrajudicial executions, disappearances, torture, rape, and all of these things, the response of the government cannot be only compensation. They should also actually look into who perpetrated these abuses and try them and prosecute them in a court. And that's, that's something that compensation shouldn't replace. So you mentioned that, you know, uh, about the other uh, national and international bodies which have echoed the recommendation of the Given Ready Committee, and then we have established that, okay, it's taking a long time, um, and I guess the challenge of uh, the persecution and getting justice per se, um, but what is the... You know, what, what can the international body or national body do in such a case? What is the next step? So I think one of the things that is uh, really important to highlight is that laws like the APSPA, they violate even India's international obligations. So India has signed on to a range of human rights treaties, and there are things that the government is supposed to protect, like the right to life, the right to justice, the right to be free from torture. And laws like the APSPA violate all of these things. And this is something that the international bodies and the UN committees they have repeatedly said that um, laws like the APSPA violate the right to life, they violate the right to family, they violate uh, the protection against torture and other treatments. And in terms of the next step, there are many things that the government can do. So, and then of course, the most obvious thing for the government to do is to repeal the act. Uh, that's a fundamental first step. But it's a very difficult first step, and it's, um, the government hasn't shown any, it's always shown reluctance in the next step. It doesn't look like it's something they will do in a hurry. Uh, I think each of these international bodies, they have also put in place a lot of other measures that the government should, uh, other steps that the government should take. So, for example, investigate all allegations of human rights abuses that have happened in areas in which they have prosecuted prosecute all of those people. Um, and these are like smaller first steps that the government should start taking immediately. Because even if the APSA is in place, it shouldn't be a tool to perpetuate impunity. If there have been human rights violations committed in these areas, the government should be investigating them, they should be prosecuting them, they should be punishing the people who are responsible for them. And that's something that the government I mean, should be doing today. They should be using the APSA as a tool to cover this up. Um, more specifically, like we mentioned, um, a lot, no case 
of wrongdoing under the AFSPA can be prosecuted without the permission of the government. But in cases where it's a clear case of a human rights violation, where a security, a member of the security forces has obviously done something that they weren't supposed to do, the government should be granting permission for prosecution in all of such cases, should be ensuring that at least in those cases, the victims of human rights violations see justice. So, yeah, so there are a lot of things, um, I guess, people are looking up to the government, but um, since it has taken a long process and also from your report, it looks like there was no answers as to why, you know, the recommendations are not uh, taken. So what can the international body or any other civil society, is there any accountability? Is there something which could be done from the international body? I think uh, the civil society groups, both in Manipur and in other parts of the country and world, are already doing an amazing job, job of holding the government to account, of reminding the government that this is a problem and that's something that is so important to keep the pressure on the government. And it's wonderful that it's happening, um, that the, that the spirit of protest of uh, resistance to laws like the AFPA has always existed and will always continue to exist. And that's such an incredibly important and um, an inspiring thing for, for everybody to see. And that's something that, that's fundamental for making the government feel under pressure, for making them give answers to why they're not implementing these recommendations and hopefully eventually moving towards actually implementing them. The role of international bodies is, again, it's to continue with the advocacy, continue with the pressure, continue with letting people know what is happening um, under the name of laws like the AFSPA in regions like Manipur. The sort of human rights abuses, the denials of justice, making these public, ensuring that these facts are investigated and known to people, so that it's easier for groups to push the government to build pressure against laws like this. That's an incredibly important task. And that's exactly what you're doing, like, you know, magnifying and highlighting what's happening and uh, following up on such a very long and lengthy process on cases like, you know, which comes under the whole umbrella of so. Yes, absolutely. And it's, I mean, there are so many other people who are doing that as well. And that's, that's really the, that's all, I guess, at this point in time, we should continue to do, you know. Right. Yeah, so thank you so much for sharing your thoughts and, um, you know, uh, taking an initiative on this work um, because people have kind of stopped believing and, you know, it's such a long time and you don't see anything. I guess the people have kind of lost faith because you don't see the justice. So do you have any comment about the fast which uh, Irong Sharmila has been having, um, you know, with regards to AFSA? I mean, it's an incredibly inspiring and brave, I mean, she's an incredibly inspiring and brave person. And um, I think we're all lucky to, to be witness to something like this. It's a brave and important act of resistance against a draconian law. And it gives everybody great inspiration and courage to, I mean, if Iram Sharmila has just been the beacon of hope in this struggle for everybody to just look up to see the face of this. And we then, you know, we think about think about the after, think about how terrible it's been. That's what gives all of us inspiration and courage. Right. And I mean it's it's the form of non violent way of protesting, but uh, with the way things are going and the slowness, it's very discouraging. Um because, you know, for yeah. people like me and her who wants to talk about such things in a peaceful manner. It doesn't seem to have any progress or, or speed in the way we would want. But yes, I think we still have hope and um, definitely we want to thank you and everybody who has been uh, working on this and talking about EFSPA and letting people know, um, you know, what it does to common people. Like. Yeah, so thank you so much for sharing your thoughts. You know, it's uh, really such a pleasure to have this conversation with you and also, just to see the other podcasts and blogs that you've put up, they're really, really wonderful. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. So I'm trying to expand this show to include people like you who are talking and featuring about Manipur and, you know, uh, kind of make it like a connecting point for all of us. Okay, so thank you so much for your time today. And thank you so much again for reaching out. It was really lovely to meet you. Great. All right.